There we go. So, we left two weeks ago. We were we introduced what were time series and what were ARMA models. We saw what, what was the stationarity. We saw the different R, AR and MA models, so auto regressive and moving average models. We quickly checked um, check the air, air passengers data, which we will use still in, in this lesson. So let's quickly refresh this one. We're looking at some some um, common time series functions. So we're looking at our time series data, which is number of air passengers per month since 1949 up until 1960. So summary, we don't have any NAs, we don't have any outliers. Monthly okay. frequency should be from yeah. frequency 12 because there's 12 months in a year. Okay, I don't remember if we if we got up to this point, but let's recap. So let's it's always important to see your data. Okay? It does it doesn't matter if if you're looking at sales or if you're looking at your passengers, you always want to see your data regardless of what it is. It give, watching a plotted data gives you a lot more information than what you might imagine. Okay, so in this in this case, we have a time series, a monthly time series. However, what can you guys tell me about the time series? It's not stationary, that's correct, yes. Seems seasonal, that's really important. Yes, Maridere, yes. Uh, it doesn't have a constant variance, that's correct. What else? Tell me everything that you can imagine from this same series. Imagine your life depends upon describing this set of lines. It's growing, yes. It's it definitely has an upward trend, right? So those are very important inform set of information, right? So it's not stationary. The variance looks growing. That the the trend is growing. It it seems seasonal. What what does seasonal mean? Okay, we're going to see what seasonal means um, in this class. However. Just as an introduction, seasonality means a repetition of patterns in a specified set of frequency. So in this case, it looks like reaching the end of the year, so like December, airline passengers spikes up. And also there's some spikes in the middle of the year. Okay. What if you if you just fit a uh, linear regression, you clearly see the upward trend, right? Even though we both have a pair of eyes and we can see that it has an upward trend, right? So autocorrelation. You guys are now experts in autocorrelation, but since this was for the first class of time series, it is a very powerful tool into determining what can we take about the data. However, now that you guys are experts in time series, you might want to tell me that looking at this plot of autocorrelation doesn't really give me a lot of information. Why? Well, it doesn't give me a lot of information. 
that that is um that is a really good point, monetary. Yes, because it shows like all that are significant. So are we going to make a an an our regressive model with like thirty lakhs? In this case, lakhs are months, so it might be a little confusing. But are we going to make uh, an auto regressive model with a lot of lakhs? That's not very parsimonious, right? So what we did last last class was just testing an our an AR one, and I think we tested also an MA one model. Yeah, so we tested an AR one. We saw how how it fitted our data. Not bad, right? We tested an ME one. Not not as good <laughs> as the MA data, as the AR model. Okay. And now now I'm going to enter forecasting. Okay. Now you guys have have now a lot more tools since two weeks ago. Okay. So I'm going to use the function predict. Okay. And I clearly cannot type forecast in my code in my code. Okay. I'm going to use the function predict. So predict takes a model. So in this case we we've saved our model in the objects MA and in the object AR. So with that model, we're going to predict. Now, using just predict without arguments, just predicts one period ahead. Okay, so if we do predict, we have this object, okay? We have this object of pred, which gives us our new value. So remember our data ends on December 1960. So our next data point is January um, 1961. If we want to obtain just the value, then we can get this one. Now, why does it does it gives us the standard standard deviation as well? Because forecasting volatility is also very important, and we're going to see that in starting next week. So that is predicting one value. Let's see what predicting 10 is. Get the start of uh, 1961, right? If we if we do 12, then we get the whole year of 1961, right? Yeah, vale. So what predict does is it takes a model. We, we have two models, right? We have an AR1 model and an MA1 model. We've saved those models to objects. So the the AR1 model is saved to the object AR and the MA model is saved to the model MA. So if we use the function predict and give the model as an argument, we can get a prediction of our model. So what it does is what you've seen mathematically already. With your data, you predict the error and thus predict the next value. Okay. SE is the no. So the forecast SE is the standard deviation of well yeah you you can tell this is a for, forecast error. I'm not sure. It it's predict. It's this one. I don't know if you want me to zoom in the code. Oh, the equation. So let me see if I have an equation on, on latex over here. Should plot the AR one. So in this case, you usually have xt some some value, xt minus one, the error t, right? Now what happens if you do this? You 
that is all your equation. You have this one estimated with your model, and this is just white noise. It, it's it's just a uh, it's just a white noise. So this specific algorithm that the base R packages package yeah it's an it's a random shock. So the specific algorithm that R is using, I do not know. I could investigate it, but it it, it is just a, a random shock. Yes. Back to this one, and no problem. Here. Okay, so if we do predict instead of just without arguments, we put in ahead 12, then we get the whole year of 1961. If we do 24, then we get 1961 and 1962 all complete. Now let, let's let's predict n values and why uh, does our forecast error matter? Because our forecast error allows us to to construct our confidence intervals, so we know how much our actual value might vary. In a, in this case, it's ninety five percent confidence. Okay. So this is our general data, right? However, check that we've plotted up to 1961. Why? Because we can add values on the right still. Okay. So if we if we forecast 10 values, we can do our forecast now check that this forecast it's not really that good right because this is our confidence interval it's pretty big like this this could be a monkey throwing darts right this is this is an accurate oh let's let's try it with the ma model that we have so the same the same steps just with MA in our MA model instead of our, our um, AR model. Now this one is even worse, <laughs> right? Because at least the other one looked like it might continue the trend. Now this one really looks like nothing that could be exact. So how might you actually know if your fit is good? Okay, so once you have your models ready, you need to answer an important question, like should you choose your AR or MA model? Just visually, you guys said it's the AR, right? So how do you choose in between models? And and we, we talked a, a little bit about this. So there there is a goodness of fit called information criterions. So you have the, the Akaic information criterion, you have the Bayesian information criterion, and you have the, the Hannah Arvera, you have a lot of a lot of different information criterions. Usually the most used one is the is the Akaic one in time series. So the math underlying is not not really important. However, what you can see for example, what is the correlation in between both of your fits? So you, you fitted two models. You fitted an AR model and an MA model. The correlation of those uh, is 995. So they are not that far apart, even though visually they might look really far apart. Okay. So what is the Akai of each model? 1428 and 1618. So your rule of choice, which model do you choose?
Why, Omar? Because it's the Exactly, right? So let me let me quickly put the Akaike formula. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the Akaike formula. This is the Kaige formula, okay? So it's it's basically like a score, all right? So K is the number of, of parameters that you guys are using on on the model, and the L is the likelihood li the likelihood function. So L n of L is a log likelihood function. So basically, if your function has a higher likelihood value, it means that your fit is resembles more your actual data so if l is higher it means that your fit is better so since this has a negative on top of it then if this value is higher it'll make your akaike lower which means that the best model We'll have the lower Akaike score. Okay. I don't know if there's something relevant else here. It's a Python code, but it doesn't matter. So, any questions about that, guys? No, <laughs> no, Neil. So the test two is probably going to include volatility models, and you have to use some some other stuff that you haven't haven't seen yet. Um, where is I going with this? Yes, seasonal. So we are going to check season seasonal models in a bit. And then we are going to go back to our airline data and see how that compares. Okay, hopefully you can see the screen now. Seasonal models. So this is Johnson & Johnson's earnings per share data. Clearly, like the, like the airline passengers data, you have an upward trend you have an, an, an increase in volatility, you have a kind of seasonal pattern. Okay. Now, the difference is that this data, instead of the monthly data that we had in airline passengers, is quarterly. So you have per each set of three months. So the seasonality looks a little bit different, right? Because it has less, fre less frequency than uh, our, our data. However, it's still there. Now, a way to correct for the for the variance is taking the logarithm of the data, right? So we're taking our log for sure instead of just earnings. Then we have a little bit less of heteroselasticity. Okay. Now. Why is it important to use seasonal analysis and seasonal adjustments? So usually, when you have different kinds of data, you want you want them to be comparable, right? So you want to compare, for example, what was the data for this quarter versus the data of the quarter before. Now, if, if you know that there is a pattern that repeats every single set of, for example, Q4, Q4 is always better than Q2, then there's no way of actually comparing Q4 with Q2 because it always is going to be, hey, 
we have a better Q4 than our Q2, but that, that's always uh, the case, right? So if you want to normalize that behavior, you want to do a seasonal adjustment. Okay? And most economic data is actually already published seasonally adjusted. Okay? People use several different algorithms for this. The most common one is called X12, but it's nothing else than taking a seasonal regression, and we're going to see what that is, and adjusting for it. Okay. And also, it is very important in forecasting, which is what we're, um, we're seeing right now. So what is for our earnings per share data? If we take the, the autocorrelation function of our earnings per share data, we have this, this plot. Not really, not really a lot of information like uh, I think Maritere was mentioned before. You have every single lag that's significant, right? You won't make like an AR27 model just because of that. Right? It's not very parsimonious. Now what happens if you take the, the difference of our data? If you take the difference of our data, now you don't have... Um, now you don't have earnings per share, right? You have change of earnings per share, quarter or quarter change. Now, instead of this one, we have this kind of autocorrelation function. Now, on this kind of autocorrelation function, it shows some periodicity, right? It looks like every single, what, four, it's changing. But it's still, it's still not enough. What happens is if instead of doing the first difference, we do the fourth difference. Okay, so we're comparing not quarter over quarter now, we're comparing year over year. Okay. Now this one looks like this. Now this one actually looks like something we, we might we might be able to use, right? But let's not stop there. Let's go one step ahead. So instead of using the year over year difference, let's look at the year over year difference of a quarter over quarter difference. Okay, so what you're seeing right now so with the quarter or quarter difference, you can see the growth quarter or quarter. With the year over year difference, you can see the growth year over year. With the year over year difference of the quarter over quarter difference, what you can see is the acceleration of the earnings. Okay, because it's like a, a second derivative, right? Now, that is a lot more important when doing equity analysis, okay? especially when you're anal analyzing growth companies. So a lot of people sleep on, on growth companies. However, growth companies, if you're looking at, at, a, at a quality set of companies with, with very stable um, dominion over their market and very solid future, how do you measure that very solid future with an acceleration of the earnings per share? Okay. So if we look at the at the ACF of the acceleration of earnings per share, now this one looks a lot better, right? Because in this one, you don't really see an end of it. In this one, you can just use one. Maybe this one, right? But the others don't really pass the confidence intervals. Okay. Now, after, after people started analyzing this kind of topics, 
a device that you can actually um, summarize. Re remember, we used to use the lag operator, right? The, instead of instead of L, they use B. That's the other. <laughs> that's the only the only difference. So instead of lagging operator, they call it the backtrace operator. But it's the same. Okay. Now they they are backtracing not just one period. They are back tracing seasonally, right? Because remember, if we if we just did this, it would be this model. If we just did this one, it would be this model. So in, if, if you put S, if you put four instead of S, but if you combine them, if we check the acceleration, then we have to do a like a double lagging. Of course, we do the same for, we can do the same for the MA part, right? Now, what, what follows is just the math of it, the, the Box Jenkins math of it. And you can get an actual calculation of what the ACF of our new series is. And Just like the models that we've seen before, the ACF and the PACF do behave um, predictably. Okay, so if you if you have a model that's Arima one zero one, and when we apply seasonality, we introduce and I think it's it's a little bit later on, but we introduce another set of information. Right, because it's not it's not just this model. If if you look at this one, it's not just uh, an Arima one one one. Right. Now we introduce this seasonality. This one is quarterly seasonally. So. In the periodicity of our solidity, we're gonna put a four. Okay, the nomenclature we're going to see a little bit later on. I think it's over here. Yes. So this is called the airline model. Why? <laughs> because people actually using the air passengers data this discovered and analyzed this kind of this this kind of models. So mathematically, we write it. Just like this, like you saw in the previous slide. Nomenclature wise, we do the usual PDQ. However, we now introduce this new set. And the S, don't don't sleep on the S, is the periodicity of your seasonality. In this case, we've seen that our periodicity is quarterly so we put a four over there okay oh d is many times you differentiate your data so in this case we're taking the first difference we're taking a first difference over here over here so the, the minor D is one, okay? Now in the seasonal part, we're also taking a difference. So our big D, our capital D will also be one, okay? Oh, that's clear, Omar. Yeah, awesome. So for example, imagine you had um, imagine you had monthly data instead of quarterly. Okay. So a model like this, so it's an AR1 differentiated MA1, the AR part of the seasonal is a still it's it's one, 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 so you're differentiating twelve times. So you're taking the acceleration 
of the year-over-year -year growth of a monthly data. Okay. And, and you can see it right there. You're taking the acceleration of a year-over-year -year change. Okay. So how do you write this? You can write this. Yt, yt minus one. So you, you do the first one, but also you have to do the 12th difference. Yt minus 12, yt minus 13. How do you write that in terms of a lag operator? Just like this. Why do you replace these two letters? Just because of the nomenclature that's usually used in these topics. It's just it's just that don't 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 get confused because of the letters. So if you expand the the model, it looks like this mess, <laughs> right? And if you didn't know anything about seasonality, what you would you say this model is? You probably would say that it's so. What's the highest on the AR? It's 26. What's the highest on the MA? It's 13. So you would say that this is an ARMA 26 13, right? However, that, that's not really parsimonious, right? <laughs> what this ARMA 26 13 transforms into. Arima one 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 twelve. Okay. Any questions, guys? Okay, let's go further. Now, a lot of you can get to the the best model a lot of ways, right? So usually, when you're going through model searching, you, you use your box Jenkins, you use uh, you use your your own logic in order to build a set of possible models, right? Use the Lume box statistics, etc. Okay. Now you can do this for a lot of different models that you might you might want, and one of the strategies after choosing a set of models that might apply is using the exact likelihood method, which is an algorithm of, of testing different models and checking which one has the best likelihood. Okay. So after using the exact likelihood method, this guy's got this model for our our Johnson and Johnson CPS quarterly data. And it gave them a Lumebox statistic when using 12 lakhs of 10 with a p value of 0 0.44, which means that you reject and thus the model is adequate. So, another example. Now, this is not quarterly data anymore this is monthly data monthly returns data so if the, you have returns data you probably don't need acceleration right because monthly uh, returns are already growth rates right so for example you have CRS, crsp which is the repository of the university of chicago of um uh, f financial data and Decile 1 index is basically a portfolio that they make with the first decile stocks in return. And you have data from January 1970 to just before <laughs> the start of the financial crisis. Okay. Now, look at this um, data, okay? So, you have the return and the adjusted return. ACF and ACF. If you would build a model of an ARIMA 
with seasonality that you probably would pick since we have monthly data you would pick at 12 frequency seasonality right it makes sense because why there are some effects on the stock market that actually have patterns especially over long windows so for example people usually on on election periods before the election periods they usually start selling and making profits because the 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 uncertainty starts growing or for example people in september usually are varying their portfolios why because they just returned from from summer vacations and when you usually return from a vacation you thought about your portfolio okay and you have january effects you have monday effects you, there, there are a lot of uh behavioral patterns that present upon the stock market so using different methods they got these two models okay both 12 seasonally adjusted so for example this highlights the january effect that but that's something that you can see in our time. So what we want to see is how they apply this to, to the airline data. Okay. Now in the airline data, we use an AR1 model and we use an ME1 model. Clearly, there might be better models, especially if it's a seasonal model. So Again, we have seen our airline passengers data. This is how it looks. We plotted probably like 10 times. <laughs> so you guys are familiar, right? Upward trend, upward increase in volatility, um, non-stationary, everything that you guys mentioned correctly. If you look at the ACF and the PACF, it doesn't really give you a lot of information. So what did they got these guys do? So when you're forecasting, you actually want to have some test data for it, to know how good your forecast is, right? Because what we did before, we are forecasting the future, but without knowing how, how good our, our forecasting model is. Because remember, it's not the same to have a, a best fitting model for your data than to have a best forecast model for your data. Okay? They might vary. They might not be the same. Okay? Because what does what does that mean? So when you use your when you try to model your data, you use the whole data, right? So imagine you have a hundred information, a hundred observations. You use a hundred information observations to do your fit. Okay. If you try to forecast after that, you're forecasting what is called out of sample. Okay. And out of sample, you don't have anything to test upon, except when the future actually comes and you check with that realized data in the future. Okay. However, actual correct way of forecasting is you have imagine you have a hundred points again a hundred observations you split your data okay you split your data into two sets a training set and a test set so you use your training set to fit a model then with that model you forecast some observations so imagine you you pick 70 observations for training and 30 for test so with your 70 information your 70 observations you fit a model and you forecast or you predict 30 values and you use those 30 values to compare to your test set so now with those sets you can actually see how good your forecast is okay so this is what these guys are doing so 
they split their model. They use window, which is a function that you can use for time series data, to cut their data up until 19, um, 1957, because they add some months. They are going to fit a model of ARIMA 011, 011 with 12 periodicity, which means they have an MA model, a MA1 model with 12 frequency seasonality. Okay, so they are doing is it's probably that's not there. So what they are doing is this, but just in the M part. Okay, so you take away this these two ones, and you just put the differencing on the M part. So with this model, they feed the data, right? And do you guys remember what our Akaike was? And we're using the same data, right? Do you guys remember what it was or around what value it was? Ours was less than 200? No. <laughs> Ours was, so for our MA model, it was like 1600. And for our AR model, it's like 1400, both in the positives. So clearly, <laughs> this model is better, right? Just, just from looking at this. Again, what is our model? Is an ARIMA 011, 011 with 12 frequency seasonality. So after, after using a model in your training data, what do you forecast data? Now, what the forecast package does, it, it gives you different sets of confidence intervals. Gives you the 90% and the 95% by default, I think. So he's plotting his forecast and also he's plotting the actual data. So look how close the forecast is from the actual data. So the actual data is, is the black line and the forecast is the blue line. However, it doesn't stop there, okay? A forecaster job doesn't end because a plot looks good, right? You have to not only test your that one model, you have to test more models. So what he's doing is increasing the window. So if the time passes on, how good does my model become? Okay, so he's starting from 1953. So in this one, he tested for 1956. Okay. He's starting from 1953 onward to see if the model is actually good from the start or no, right? If you had you start had you started using this model 1953 would you have predicted correctly the data? And the answer is yes. So this is the, the time that they started forecasting. This is the forecast. The time passes on, the forecast is still good, still good, still good. Okay, this, this is what, what's basically a back test. How, how good your model might have be. And then you cry, right? Because you you could have made a lot of money, and you didn't. <laughs> so you're doing H steps ahead, 
predictions. So on the first one, we predicted 48 steps ahead, so 48 months, so four years. And each of these ones, each steps ahead are more, right? So these were four years, these are now six years. And less and less and less and less. This one is less than four, for example. I won't I won't bother you with this. However, what what you what is important uh, on this slide is one of the one of the metrics to evaluate how good your forecast is. Okay? You might have heard of of mean square prediction error. In the mean square prediction error is very similar to this. Okay, so what you have is your 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 forecast versus your actual data. So how good how how apart is the actual difference? So how off are you from the actual value? Okay, now there's another metric that actually adjusts for some some other things like volatility and you can use this to evaluate how good your forecasts are so this is testing different models okay now do you want your root mean prediction square root mean square prediction error to be higher or lower You want it to be lower, right? And the actual two lowest are the one that we used and this one. Okay. Why lower? Because it means that you are less far from the actual values. It's very similar than mean square prediction error. Mean square prediction error is just this. So relative to the model that we used, these are the mean square the rel the uh, the relative <laughs> mean square root mean square er is mean square error. Sorry guys, I, I was up to like three a.m. in <laughs> reading since. So you can see that no model consistently beats the model that we used. There's a model that there are two or three or four models that on a on a set of periods, so for two, four, six steps ahead, they were a little bit better. But consistently, there's there are no models that are better than ours. So you have different um different confirmations that your model is actually good now this these are the the prompts of the different models you can also check the akaike for all of them the one that we use has minus 483.4 now this is probably on the on the whole data not just on the training like we saw before now you can see Not even, not only our model is consistently better, it also has a, low, a lower Akaike. So just another confirmation to put upon. And the whole code for, for doing all of this is over here. So you guys can, can look it up on, on your own. Check it line by line if, if you want. And these are the two best models with the on the prediction intervals. The actual data is the black dot, for example. And the model that we used at the start was the red one. However, it's debatable that both the red and the green models are really good.
Questions, guys. No, we're good. Okay. <laughs> then we'll move on and check what was the take home for last semester. So, the last semester, I gave uh, some tractor sales data, and I wanted I wanted the students to use different models and forecast using different metrics. Now, one of the metrics I gave them is the SMP, which is the symmetric mean absolute percentage error. Now. This is better than the mean square prediction error because it accounts for different variability that you might have inside your data. So you actually want a consistent um, estimation of what your forecasting is doing. Now, what this is doing is taking the absolute deviation of your forecast versus the actual data and adjusting it for how big your data is actually is, okay? So let's look at the data, okay? So what they had to do is load the data, plot it, explain some characteristics, take the first difference and analyze it, taking the log, taking the first difference of the log, using the last transformation to fit a normal model. And after finding three good models, forecast, three years ahead the data. Then find the model with the best prediction power, employing different tests that you guys have seen in the class. And then creating a function to calculate the SMAP and getting the best the best data. Forecasting tips. Define a cutoff point, so 70% training, for example, or 30 and 30% test. Separate your data into training and, and test subsets based on your cutoff point. Fit your model to the training data and do checks on the on the. I should have write. <laughs> I should have write this. Do checks on the test data. Yeah, that's my bad. Once you have confidence in your model, apply them to a test sub. Oh no, it's good. Apply them to a test subject. Okay. So let's look at the data. I also. <laughs> So I did the the best likelihood um, the best likelihood test in order to get the the model with the highest likelihood, and I got a SMAP of twelve point five. So I said, what's a, a better SMAP gets an extra point, and a lot of people actually did because brute forcing. It's not the way to do stuff. You have to use logic behind the way, right? So one of the one of the works that they presented last term. So this is how the tractor sales data looked. What can you guys tell me about the tractor sales data? Growing. That's good for the business, right? <laughs> what else? What else? What else?
rates tend to decrease around winter. Winter where? Winter in the US, yes, that's correct. Why might that be? Snow, right? It's hot it's harder to to harvest your crops when there are climate conditions that don't allow you to do it. Right? So this is this is different than the usual Christmas like effect than that we see in in most sales data, right? So that's why this one is really interesting. And this guy actually discovered something that they didn't realize when they did the differencing for the seasonality. They picked a specific number, which they might not know the, the meaning of, but they actually got it um, correct because it, it matches the harvesting and, and crop seasons. That's not quarters. Okay? It's usually five months instead of quarters or, or semesters. So, and that is a real uh, need Fun fact. Okay, so they take the first difference. Now, if you take the first difference, now you have a um, an stable mean, right? However, you still don't have a stable variance. So you can see that the cumulative mean with the first difference is kind of stable. If you take the logarithm instead, you don't have a stable mean, however, you kind of have a stable variance. Now, if you go one step ahead and you take the first difference of log, then you have a stable kind of stable variance and a stable mean, both of them. They check their residuals. Now, this is really good. The ACF, this looks now something that you can actually apply a model to. Cumulative mean, clearly much better, looks, um, what was the word I was going to use? Um, stable. So they split the data. They split the data into 70-30, and then they pick based on what the test they used, they pick three models. First, an Arima 5001012. Now, why doesn't they don't have a one over here? Because they are applying this model to the already differentiated data, OK? If you apply this model straight out to the sales data, you won't get a, a good result. If you apply it to the to the sales data, then you have to put a one over here and over here. Okay, but they are applying it to the log log to the different of log sales data. Um. Okay, so they pick five instead of six. And this looks kind of good, right? Residuals, stable around zero, not really that far apart. Now, you always have to check if your residuals are actually mean zero. If they are not, then it means that you have some garbage in, the, in, your, in your residuals and might be correlated to the variables that you're using to estimate your model. And that's good. Second model, they differentiate twice, so they are getting the acceleration in this in this time of the seasonality. Okay. Again, residuals around zero, a little bit more uh, more noise on this model, but still something that's pretty um, forecastable. Again, they pick. Um, uh, an acceleration model. However, on this, they're doing a, a one acceleration model. So 
this might just be a, a throw in something that actually fits good, but month over month over the difference of year over year. They, they do all of the archaicus. The second model looks better on archaic terms. The in case of the Bayesian information criterion is also the second model that looks best. No, it's the third model that looks best. Okay. And then they calculate their symmetric mean absolute percentage error. Now you want the least amount of error possible, right? So they get that model three does the least error. And I, I believe they have the graphs on the code. Let's see. Let me load up this. I need to change the location of the data. Font 2022, tutorials, tutorial three, and video. Let me change what I'm sharing. Yeah, they, they, they do plot it. Now, I have uploaded them to Blackboard. Okay, so this is how they check their what we saw before. The amount of tractors sold, the, this is a raw data, what you want to forecast. Then the difference of tractors sold, the log of it, and the diff of log. Okay. Do they not plot the forecasted values? Oh, that's bad. Okay. Let me get one that actually plots the forecasted values really quick. Yes, take home solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see this one. Now this one doesn't as well. Okay, yeah. Let's see this one. So for example, what, what this what these girls did is they also checked if there is a change year over year in the pattern. So by doing this kind of plot, what you can see is checking intra-year how the pattern behaves. So clearly, you can see that mid-year, the sales are highest. And they fall in November. And they do a little bit of pickup in December. Why? Because of probably Christmas offers. Okay. Also, the decomposition of the time series. So a time series has several um, several objects tied together, several characteristics. You have the trend, you have so for example you have the actual time series. Okay. 
you have the component, you have the seasonality component, and you have the noise that's behind of it. Let me check the same things that the other group did. And then we have the forecasts. Okay. You have the forecasts with the data. Looks kind of really close to the actual data, right? The behavior looks really similar. I don't remember what their, oh, there, there you go. So they didn't calculate correctly the the SMAP. I think I, I calculated it apart and they actually had a good fit. But you can actually see that the forecast actually matches the pattern that the time series had before. Okay. So we've seen how it looks in tractor sales data We've seen how it looks in the air passengers data that we use to, to introduce this kind of topic. And maybe you will see another type of data in an assignment. But yeah, uh, I don't know if you guys have any questions. If not, then that's it for today. Um, I don't know. So the test is, is still in two weeks. So the delivery date might be the Wednesday after that. So the Wednesday of midterms, I think. Yeah, we, we told you guys yesterday that. So yesterday on the night class, we moved the we moved the test. Oh yeah, so we have a we have a class pending. It it might be best that we do it after the class on Wednesday that you guys have on with Jesus. So I suggest either Thursday or Friday night because some of you told me that you guys don't want more classes on Saturday. But oh come on, Fabio, you're you're already you're already a a big guy. Um, so, so yeah. So after after Wednesday, we we should have our our recovery of of the class that we that we lost. So the options are, yeah, the options, the options are Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. Now Thursday or Friday, late. Sure. The thing is, we only have eighteen. We only have six, sixteen, sixteen students. Be sure. See. Oh, you know, at 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 seven thirty, I'm still at meetings. Oh. 
Gonzalo, entonces, ¿la PC es, la, es el siguiente sábado, la parte escrita? No, en two. So not the next one, the one after that. That is correct, Ale. Micron reported Q4. Okay, so it looks like it will be Thursday night. Okay, Nicolas, please confirm me throughout the week if that is a final decision. But yeah. If you guys don't have any further questions, then I guess that's it for today. Have a good weekend, guys. And again, your take home part of the test was really good. So congrats. Keep up the good work. All right, guys. See ya. Have a good one.